I th- I'm not sure whether it is before or after Hatzot by you yet. I think it's a little bit before Hatzot. So um, there's a limit in what it is we can speak about, given that it's before Hatzot and how much Torah that I can put out. However, um, the Hachamim allow us to speak about the issues that have to do directly with the day. So we can read Echa and we can read the portions of Yirmiya and we can read the elements of, of, of the Hurban um, in order to be able to focus on the Avelut. I am conscious that we have 25 minutes, so I'm going to do my best to be able to uh, present to you um, from my heart to yours on this day, on this difficult day. Um, Broad strokes, because in order to be able to get into full nitty gritty detail, we would need to take more time than we have, but I'm going to present broad strokes. And I do have to say, it's after Hatzot for me, so I can say it's really good to see all of you and to see your faces. And I am very grateful that everyone has uh, a little leeway. All right, <laughs> I'm very grateful that everyone has um, come to join and uh, and to listen and to share. So um, I'm going to get right to it because of the timing. What we know about Tisha B'Av, of course, what we speak about all the time with regards to Tisha B'Av is the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, both Beit HaMikdash for that matter, and that our minds are constantly focused on this day over the destruction and how it is that it's manifested for our people over the last 1,952 years. But as I often say there, and as the Hachamim point out, um, and his Psak and Harambam and Mishneh Torah, there are origins to this day that go beyond earlier, further, further back than the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And what I'd like to do with you today is to use that as a source in order to be able to present, you know, and to kind of think about the things that I want to, I want to think about together with you during this time. And of course, what that is, the, the source of this day is not the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. The source of this day is not um, the loss of Yerushalayim. The source of this day happened much earlier. The source of this day is the the day that the spies came back from scouting out Eretz Yisrael and presented to the nation a report that created a tremendous breakdown in the people. So what they do is they go in and uh, they spend 40 days in Eretz Canaan, what was later supposed to be Eretz Yisrael, and this is supposed to be a reconnaissance mission. I mean, this is supposed to be just, you know, you go in, you figure out the territory, have an idea of what it is that's happening and come back and let us know what's, what the story is. This was not a question in terms of the mission as to whether we can or cannot go, whether we should go or not go. That wasn't really uh, the remit of the, of the mission. When they come back, they give their commentary on it. And they say, um, look, we saw the land. It is a great land. It's a beautiful land and uh, we can't go because the people in that land are too too powerful. They're too powerful, they're too much for us. And so it's a no-go. Uh, we should all turn back and head to Egypt um, and, call it, and call it quits and forget about it. And what happens as a result of that is um, the people, there's pandemonium. I mean, people completely break, completely break down. They lose all of their wherewithal to be able to, you know, kind of focus on actually going into the land. And worst of all, Hakadosh Baruch Hu has had it. And so he, his first response to this is, Moshe, I'm wiping these people out. It's it's over. I'm taking them all out. I'm going to keep to a very strict adherence of my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, and I'm going to start with you, Moshe, and we will do a new, we will, we will set up a new nation. So what I want to do with you is I want to look a little bit deeper into what it is that happened over there, because there, there were mechanisms that were there that created the problem. And when we understand by looking at the root of the day, which is without question, what happens with the Miraglim, right? What happens with the, the spies as they come back from Eretz Canaan and make this report, which occurs on Tisha B'Av as far as our tradition is concerned, and we recognize it as that. When we look at the root and we look at the roots of the root, right? We, we understand why did that happen? What was it that was going on with these people that caused them to come back and speak the way that they did and to completely undermine, completely undermine 
everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had essentially promised, supported, guided towards, uh, brought all events in order to be able to, to bring them through. And, and, and what we end up having is this, is this complete breakdown. So in order to be able to do that, I want to be able to look at the Pesukim with you. I'm going to, I think, am I able, I'm able to share the screen, right? So I'm going to look at the Pesukim with you. And, um, and to recognize two key aspects uh, in terms of what it is that happened. Um, and to, 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 to look at those as the source of the, of the entire problem. So bear with me, I will share the screen and let's take a look quickly with, at the Pesukim, yeah? So here is the Pesukim, this is the story, okay? The story is they come back by They say, look, it's a great land. It's flowing with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. Ephes, all of that is zero, right? It doesn't matter. Literally is what Ephes means. They're too powerful. These fortified cities are extremely powerful and secured. We saw giants there. And what they essentially do, I mean, so I, I want everybody to, I mean, I can't necessarily have a tremendous amount of feedback. Everybody's muted, but, but, but let's consider for a minute. If we read these Pizukim without just watching the story and we listen to what it is that they're saying, they're coming back. And what does this instill into the people, right? The people are sitting there, they're waiting to hear a report and they come back and they say, these are ferocious, powerful, fortified giants that we are coming to yeah i mean if if you you hear that and you take it as it is because this is these are the only eyes and ears that you have are this is this communication coming back well how does one how does one respond to that what does that instill that instills fear into the people i mean high levels of fear yeah now there are two options when you hear this you can either hear the ideas that are that are instilling panic and fear and regress as a result of the of the report and you can say but wait a minute that's what they say but god has said otherwise and we've seen otherwise we came out of egypt and egypt was flattened we walked through the the sea for god's sakes right in, in, in at a situation which was set up mind you, to be hopeless. Yeah, I mean, you have a sea on one side and you have Paro on the other side. It was, it was meant to be hopeless. It was set up for hopelessness in order that there should be a pathway opened up by God that nobody would have ever anticipated. We have bread falling out of the sky. I mean, we have these tremendous support systems. We have a cloud, pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night that's leading us. The pot that's to say that there was not a possibility in the face of this report that was meant to instill fear uh, of, of responding otherwise and saying, look, I mean, all the evidence doesn't necessarily point in that direction. The possibility to be able to hold strength and, and confidence in the face of the fear was there, which is important. But that is not how the people responded. The people fell for it, hook line and sinker the people absorbed and embraced the fear and that was the first problem so now you have a people that are meant to be confident free self-sufficient right and self by self-sufficient i mean standing on their own two feet as they are in their own identity and instead what you have is a complete breakdown of that you have this panic that ensues and a fear that ensues. And what happens to a human brain when it is in a state of fear is the utmost destruction because there is no reason, meaning there's no sense of reality. There is no sense of self. And all that a human being does in a place of fear is protect at all cost. And protection includes pointing fingers, and blame and all of that wonderful stuff that we live with, right? But that's what happens. So now you have an entire nation that is dropped in fear. Now I will say, <laughs> if it was only fear, 
that would be that would be bad, but it wouldn't be as catastrophic as this ended up being. It was not only fear. There was more than that. There was shame as well. Why do I say that? Why do I say there was shame? What does it mean that there was shame? There was this profound feeling of, of, of inadequacy, of com being completely less than and unworthy and devalued. As a people, right? As a nation, they felt absolutely devalued. How do I know that? There is one pasuk that closes the section, right? That tells me that. So, you know, before I look at that pasuk, it's important to see that Kalev, right, he's, he's the one that's standing against all of this, right? So you have this onslaught of fear, right? They're pouring out massive amounts of fear to the nation. And there's one, one individual that comes up and he says, no, we can do this, right? We're able to do this. It wasn't enough, right? So he's pep talking, right? He's pep talking. And the pep talk might have worked if it wasn't for the following line. And the following line is, no, it's not enough that we are afraid. They go back and they say, I said, they say, you know, I don't know if it's enough that we explained to you that we saw the giants. It's important for you to understand, these spies are saying, that that we, in our own eyes, were like insects. Grasshoppers, literally, but like we saw ourselves, vanehi, it's not ra'inu, right? Vanehi bernu, our eyes, meaning the way that we saw the circumstance was that we were insects. And not only did we see ourselves as being insects, we are telling you, ken ha'inu bernehem. That's what we were in their eyes, a bunch of insects. Well, that is a whole nother situation because it's one thing to be fearful, but know that you are a nation that you are a people that can hold your head high and that you can be spoken to in order to be able to remember who you are and be able to recognize your strengths and move forward. But when they hear that Kalev is speaking out and saying, listen, we can do this. We have the power. We have the ability. Their response to that is, we saw ourselves as insects and that's how they saw us. That is shame. That's not just fear. That's not just we're afraid to go to war with these people. That is, we do not even begin to measure or rate in the face of these people as a worthy opponent, right? Now, forget about a weak human cohort. We are insects as far as we're concerned and as far as they're concerned. And that, my friends, is the source of Tisha B'Av. The report was one thing. The response of the report, what it created, is what created the day of Tisha B'Av. So if we were to pause, if we were to bring everything down to core components, we would not be remiss and off in saying, and I'll bring this back up uh, in a minute, we would not be remiss in saying that the source of this day, what created this day, were profound feelings of fear and shame in our people. And those are not, you know, ancient feelings. Those are not things that are unfamiliar to us as human beings. The question is, what, what, what lies even underneath that? Yeah, what lies even underneath that? What lies underneath that is there's a sense that there, when one believes that one is not worthy and not even on par, right? Not even of the same species, right? That's literally what they're saying. They're saying they're not even of the same species, not even mammals, right? They're insects compared to these people, which is quite poetic, but nonetheless, it is what it is. I mean, it's poetry for a reason. It presents us in that light. What that's saying is, it's not just to them that we're that way, it's to us that we're that way. And what is the major thing that they're forgetting over here as a result of those conclusions? What they are forgetting over here as a result of those conclusions is God walks with you. I mean, what does he have to do? God walks with you. He escorted you out of Egypt, decimated them, before your eyes, took you out 
as he himself says at Har Sinai on the wings of eagles. That's also poetry, but that's poetry meant to present to you, that you are flown out of Egypt on the wings of eagles, that pillar of cloud and fire that escorts you, the bread that is brought to you from the heavens. You walk with God. And the fear and the shame was so powerful that God was eclipsed as a result of it. And this is God in the midst and the presence of the people. So if we ever question the power of our own fear and shame, read the Torah. Because what the Torah teaches us is God can be present in your midst in full force and our own fear and shame can eclipse him. And that creates Tisha B'Av. And that's what this day is. So in essence, what this day is, is, is a, a time that we strip away all comforts and buffers that keep the pain of fear and shame away from us. And we sit in it and we realize that if we still have this day running with us in our people, then we still have these elements running with us in our people. There is still the fear and there is still the shame within the people of Israel. Now that is on a national level. I want to address the personal level, but before I do, I want to speak about it. We have to recognize it on a national level because this is a national holiday and it is a holiday. This is a holiday like any other holiday. We don't say Tahanunim today. No Tahanun. We say Kinot, but we don't say Tahanun. And the reason we don't say Tahanun, we don't say the supplications because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is mourning with us today. He's sitting with us today. And we'll talk about the mourning in just a minute, what that is. But that, this is the origin of the day. So in the same way that we have holidays that celebrate happiness and joy, like Sukkot, and in the same day that we have holidays that celebrate freedom, like Pesach, we have a holiday that looks at fear and shame as part of the human condition. And what it creates in us. And what we lose as a result of holding on to it. Now, I don't say that in any way, because as I say, you know, I, I, I try to say this, whenever it is that I speak, that, that my sharing of this is really for me. This is something that I need to hear all the time. And so, you know, I appreciate that we have 225 people, God bless you, eavesdropping. But these are things that are not easily released. If they were easily released, we would not be 1,952 years running. And that's important for us to remember. It takes time for a nation to grow out of fear and shame. So there were times where we were running stronger than others and we were able to build a Beit HaMikdash twice. But the Beit HaMikdash gets lost because we fall back into it very severely. I mean, the last Beit HaMikdash, the Hachamim say it, the reason that it was destroyed was because of Sinat Hinam, because we just hated each other. What causes the hatred of each other? Why is it that we just cannot tolerate each other? And this said, the Nitziv says this so, I mean, so powerfully in, uh, in his opening of, of uh, the Haimek Davar, his, uh, his Pirush in the Torah. And he says that the bottom line, what was going on, he says there wasn't even the, the riffraff, right? I mean, those were the top people in the nation, the Hachamim, the people, all of the nation. Before the destruction of Beit HaMikdash, they treated anyone who did not follow Torah Mitzvot as the way they saw they should, as sedukiva pikoros, he says, as heretics. If you don't do like I understand and I see, and you are not in my control space, and you are not following in the way that I think you should be following, you are not just not acceptable to me, you are an absolute invalid member of my nation, Yeah. That, this is the Nitziv says, anybody feel free to open it, but that's exactly what this Nitziv says. That's what was going on. So how is a house that is meant to be the nexus and interface between the people and God that is being eclipsed 
by the fear and shame and all of the protective hatred that happens as a result of that, how is that house supposed to stand? So it's exactly as it says, the Midrash says that when the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, a voice comes out of heaven and says, Kemach tahina tahint. You've, you've ground down flour that was already ground. There was, no, there was no house there. It didn't exist. There wasn't anything really there. An edifice, it wasn't functional. And so for us, for us as a nation, it is important for us to recognize and to question to what degree are we afraid of being who we are? Still. So yes, I, I will say, I will say, it's after Hatzot for me, so I will say, we have come a long way. We're not even allowed to say that before Hatzot. <laughs> we have to be focused on the, on the elements that are, that, are, that, are, that are painful, but we've come a long way. I mean, we are after all home. I mean, we're in quarantine. We're not able to get there if we're not there, but we're home. And we have had, and we have seen over the last 70 years elements of our people expressed that had not been expressed in close to 2000. Elements of our people that have been dormant for close to two millennia. The reason I say that is because it is important for us to understand that we have made progress and that the last 1,952 years has not been for naught. And that our focus on these things helps us, but we're not done. And there's a tremendous amount left to achieve and to express. One of the core elements, and this is please important, one of the core fallouts and, 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 and essential elements of shame is unlovability. The feeling that we are not worthy of love. As a nation, most importantly, we are not worthy of love by God. And for that matter, other nations. The anti-Semitism that we experience out there is a tremendous challenge for us because it forces us, and this is only one aspect of it, it forces us to not look at others to give us our worth and value, but to recognize and understand our own value in who we are as we are, to embrace and be proud of the people that we are. And there's much to be proud of, but it is essential that we recognize that we are not only lovable, but that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us beyond Beyond. And that's why, you know, Moshe does not start speaking. He first talks about fear at the beginning of Devarim. The whole of the parasha Devarim is about fear. Read it through. Everything from beginning to end, the whole parasha is about fear. And then he opens parasha Vayit Hanan, and it's all about love. Look at it. The whole parasha Vayit Hanan is about how HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us and how we should love him. The Ve'avta, right? Ve'avta Adonai Lechatz in parasha Vayit Hanan. And all the close of the parasha, the close of parashat Vayit Hanan next week, I cannot wait to get to it. The close of parashat Vayit Hanan next week, the last pesukim are some of the most soaring, beautiful, embracing, loving pesukim of the entire Torah. And where Moshe, before he dies, says to us, know that God loves you. And that is essential. Ugh, we're coming close on time. So I want to I want to bring this down and wrap up for another. I'm gonna go for the full 10 minutes. Yeah, but but it's important for us to recognize. That one of the things that Moshe negotiated as a result of that time in the desert with the spies was that HaKadosh Baruch Hu needed to commit even more emphatically to being a personal God. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu's initial responses, and this is not the first time that God does this, right? But HaKadosh Baruch Hu's initial response is, Moshe, I'm, I'm out. 
I'm starting with you and we'll wait till the nation comes out. You know, I don't care if I have to do this a hundred times. We'll, we'll wait till it happens. And what Moshe says to Kadosh Baruch Hu at that time is this. He says, I'm going to paraphrase, but then I'll show you the psukim. He says, look, the problem with this people is that they are profoundly plagued with fear and shame. They lived for over 200 years where their lives did not belong to them. They belong to someone else. And they've made a terrible mistake here, yes. But you, the, the problem that they're facing is they're walking into this land and feeling that they have to do this on their own. It's a mistake of theirs. And there's no reason that they should think that. And they have every evidence to tell them otherwise. But the issue is that they need to know that you are there because we cannot do this alone. And that's the thing. None of us can do this alone. I mean us, you and me, I mean our lives. None of us can do this alone. We are not big enough to do this alone. And what is this? I mean everything that we need to do in our lives. We are not expected to do it alone. That's the whole point of the Torah. The whole point of our people, the legacy and, 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 and credo of our people is that we do not run through this world alone. And we do not expect that we are capable of doing it alone. That we are not in control and we are not the gods and we do not have the ability to be able to manipulate the situations that we believe we can or need to in order to be able to be successful and, and come through in our lives. And what is successful? Be everything that we were created to be in wholeness and pride and strength and courage. So what Moshe says to Kadosh Baruch Hu is this is not the time to pull back. Because if you pull back, it will be interpreted as weakness. Has Shalom. And if this is the issue, what we need to do is teach the people that you are there for them and that you can handle this and that you are a personal God. Yigdal na koah Adonai, says Moshe to God. Let's beef up the strength. That's Kaviachol. Of course, he's not saying Akadosh Baruch Hu, be stronger. What he's saying to Akadosh Baruch Hu is it needs to be seen that you are able to hold this by the people. They need to see that you are a personal God and you are not going to reel back and revert to a cosmic God that waits for people to work themselves out. You hear this? Look at the Pesukim. Unbelievable. So what Moshe says to Kadosh Baruch Hu is, you are in the midst of the people. You are in the midst of the people. It's, you're here in the middle and you're going to decimate them. You're walking with them. And you know what people are going to say? They're going to say you couldn't handle it. And it can't be that you can't, that should be seen that you, that you couldn't handle it. Not just because it's bad PR for God. Because we live by the fact that you are with us. And the only way that there is any salvation from fear and shame in the human condition is to recognize that you are not the source. You are not the God. There is something greater than you. And when we say something, when Israel says something, that something is the greatest thing that possibly could be. That's what we call a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And so Moshe says, And he goes into the, to the Yag Midot, into the 13 attributes, and he says, please let, let, let the people hold. And so what HaKadosh Baruch Hu responds to that is, says, I will do that, Moshe. I have forgiven as per your words. But I am God. And I'm not going to pretend that I am not. And these people failed beyond what it is that I will hold. So the people that came back and fell into that will not see the land, but their children will. Because what I will commit to you, Moshe, is 
I will bring their children for 40 years in a training practice. I will train them for 40 years. A year per day that their parents were in that land. And I will teach them that they can rely on me. And I will teach them what it means to be who they are. And there will be no fear and no shame. And they will walk into that land proud. And indeed they did. And that's what the 40 years in the Midbar was. And if you want a book, by the way, that teaches you, I gave a whole series on this, but if you want a book that teaches you how to grow beyond fear and shame and how to find your strength and personal best and how to do that in tandem with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, study the book of Bimit Bar. That's what it teaches us, among many things, but that's what it teaches us. So what it is, is a teaching of finding our courage. And the word courage is a beautiful word in, in English because it comes from the Latin cor, C-O-R. The Latin cor simply means heart. And courage is to do something with your whole heart. Not with deficiencies and not with inadequacies and not with doubts, to do something with your entire heart. For Israel, we know that our heart is powered by God. We didn't create it. We are not the, our own makers. It is powered by God. And to do something with great courage, what the Torah teaches us is that it can only be done when we recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us and that He walks with us and that we are not the gods, but we are loved. And we are great in our own selves. And that we should live, as Harambam writes at the end of Hilchot Shemitah, Yobel Kasher Asa Oto Elohim, that we should live in the way that God created you. Do you know what it means to hate someone for no reason? It means that you look into their eyes and cannot see God in their eyes. And you look into them and you see their being and you do not see that they are divine like you are. And like I am. And to look at someone that way is blasphemous. It is to spit on what God made. In no uncertain terms. And excuse me for the harshness, but it's the truth. The only one in the story that stood that way was the man whose name was whole heart, Kalev. Kalev means kol lev. And that's exactly what he says to the people over here, right? There's Yoshua bin Nun and Kalev bin Yifunel. They'll notice that Kalev is the only one that's mentioned over here when he responds. Vayahas Kalev et Am el Moshe. Kalev is the one that comes out and quiets the people. And what do they say? They say, we will go up. Tova haaretz me'od me'od. It's a beautiful land. Im hafetz banu Adonai v'hevi otanu el aretz azot. If God wishes. He will bring us into this land. Just, and so what's the one message that they tell to the people? Ach badonai al timrodu. Just don't rebel against God. We understand you're afraid. We understand the shame. We understand the concern. We understand the reticence. Just don't rebel against God. We'll work this out. But to say it's all lost, there's nothing there, we're insects, there's, they're, they're giants. Let's go back to Egypt. That is spitting in the face of God. Spitting in the face of God in precisely the same way it is to look at another person and hate them because you don't see yourself in them. You're not supposed to see yourself in them. You're supposed to see God in them. And the only reason, and the only reason we do not see God in other people is because we don't see him in ourselves. Bottom line. And people can say whatever it is that they want to say. Know that that is the core. And when you see ridicule and hatred and Lashon Hara and all of that wonderful stuff that we sit on the floor today to realize how it has, what it has made of us, know one thing at the core, like we learned from the Miraglim, it is because we do not see God in him.
or they don't see God in us. And there's only one reason that we do not see God in others. We don't see him in ourselves. And so we don't know how to identify it. And that's why there's this, you know, this beautiful pasuk in Mishleh, Hildat Adam Yiten Mokesh. The trembling of man is always a trap. It's a pitfall. Boteh Badunai Sugav. But a person who can be trusting in Akadosh Baruch Hu, he's lifted and protected. And that's the only protection that we need. So I, I'm concerned that people are going to start shouting uh, that I need to get out of this room. And I will, I will leave it on that note and say this last thing. The tikkun, the fix for Tisha B'Av is Tu B'Av. Tu B'Av, one of the things that happened was that the Hachamim told us that the tribes were allowed to marry into each other again. They weren't allowed. They had to keep to themselves. And so what we hope for during this time is as we mourn what is lost, not only in the past, but what we have not yet achieved in terms of ourselves as individuals and as a nation, because it's important to remember the nation is only as strong as the individuals that make it up. If we, if I, Joe Dweck, am having struggles and problems with fear and shame, it weakens not only myself, but my people. And so my job is to make sure that I'm doing well with that. First. And that's what we, all of us, are tasked to do. Yigdal na Adonai. Remember always how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us. And that what Moshe Rabbeinu did was negotiate a personal God. You're not going back into the cosmos. You're staying here right with us. And he is available and open. And what it takes for us is to be able to look in the mirror and see ourselves as divine, as created by his hands, and to find that value within. And in that, we come to Tubeav, love and connection, lovability and wholeness of self. That is what fixes Tisha B'Av. May we see it in ourselves. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu help us to see it in ourselves. And may HaKadosh Baruch Hu help our nation to see it collectively, that we should be able to shine in our fullness, in our individual selves, and ultimately as our nation, as a people. I wish everyone to skubin a and um, please God an easy and, and meaningful fast.